Aloha, I'm Lila Berg, and we're here at the Hawaii State Art Museum, ready to meet the people who inform, inspire, and impact our daily lives. Thank you for joining us on Island Focus. Here on the ground floor of the Hawaii State Museum. This place is very special to you. Yes, it's the cafe. Maybe you can explain a little bit uh, why it's special and how do you fit into here? Um, it's special to me because Wade and Michelle, a long time ago, entrusted me as their sous chef to come here and open up this restaurant for them to cater to the people of downtown and bring their local flavors from MW Restaurant here for everybody to have gourmet on the go style food that they can enjoy in their quick half an hour, hour lunch break. So you come here as a sous chef. Yes. And here's a place where local products are valued. Yes, every day bring in fresh local products, farms, whole farms, fresh ahi from down the street, fresh off the boat every day. And how do you create these magical kind of different meals for the downtown crowd? It comes from experience here, um, moving here from Massachusetts, traveling a lot, I try to bring those memories and special dishes that I've found and loved along the way and from what they've just taught me and I've learned living here I try to fuse them and you know try to not keep it monotonous for the everyday folk down here. What would be a special today that I could look forward to? This is one of MW's signature dishes um, mochi crusted opa so it has uh, kaki mochi that we shred finely so it looks kind of like coconut shreds um, and then we get a pan searing hot and we crust the fish inside and it creates that awesome crunchy crush and then we serve it with local whole farms banchan and then uh, yuzu kosho vinaigrette underneath a bed of somins you can't forget about that once you mix everything together it's, it's really good <laughs> Today on Island Focus, you will enjoy meeting Harry Wong, who is the Artistic Director for Kumukuhua Theatre. Glad you could be with us. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for taking the time. This is your stomping ground downtown, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I live downtown, too. Actually, walk to work every morning. So Kumukuhua Theatre is a small, intimate little theatre that I know very well from mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, maybe you can share with the audience why it's special, where it's located, and what it means to you. Kumukuhua Theater is on the corner of Merchant and Bethel Street, and it's about 100 seats in the theater. Our mission is to do plays by local writers about Hawaii. Kumukuhua, I guess it would be in proper grammar, would be <laughs> kahua kumu, mm. yeah, which mean, and a kahua would be a mound or a platform in which uh, hulas were done. And then kumu, uh, we take it to mean source. And so then the source of the theater are the writers. Mm. And so then uh, any writer that wants to say something to our community, who wants to confront the community or celebrate the community, our theater is there for them. And then so we work on them to make their plays as good as possible and then we produce them. And then that's kind of unique, I guess, in the United States. We just had a theater and communications conference in Miami Beach. Oh. And then so then there were um, a number of theaters, like there's Asian American theaters on the mainland, there's um, Hispanic theaters or African American theaters, but there wasn't a theater that was dedicated to the place they were from producing. So mm -hmm. then we produced plays about the Japanese experience here or about Chinese immigrants or so it's the not Samoan just Hawaiian diaspora. focused. It's, oh, it's, yeah, it's really local. It's, yeah, it's local. Huh. And we also have like Hawaiian plays too and Hawaiian playwrights. Well, that's my experience with you years and years ago mm -hmm. being in Kuma Kuhua's Ola Naivi play by oh, Vicky yeah. Newville, which yeah. you remembered. Yeah, Thank I you. remember <laughs> when I saw you, I was like, hey, you're in Ola Naivi. Yes, and the experience of being part of something so intimate and so um, special mm -hmm. really changed my life. Do you find that with other people too? There's one professional theater here in Hawaii. It's the... Um, well, actually, there might be two. One is the Hawaii Opera Theater. 
The other one is the Honolulu Theater for Youth. The rest of us are community theaters. Mm. And then, uh, and there's, there, there's an ethos, I guess, to it. And then one of them is that anybody, whoever wanted to get on stage, they're welcome to come. So even if they just acted in a show like in high school and then they had to go to work and take care of their kids and then now their kids are in high school, the theater is there for them to experience that art, to, to develop it as far as they can. And we've had people who've, who have never done theater, but they've always been interested and they come and they audition and then we put them up on stage and we challenge them with intense roles in which they have to act in. And then I guess Kumuku, it's also a benefit if you speak pidgin, <laughs> you know, so then you're, you're, you're welcome to talk the way you talk. And then right. for audience members, yeah, it's the first time they come and they go, hey, that's my uncle up there on stage. He sounds just like that. Well, and what I appreciate so much about what you offer the community through Kumukuhua is not just a place that's safe to explore who you are, but also to share and inspire creativity. Mm -hmm. Like here in the museum, you know, I'm very touched by the local artists that are displayed. Do you find that uh, creativity is a little bit scary for some people sometimes to reveal or? Yes, in the, in the same way that if you're an actor and you have to be vulnerable on stage, like um, there was a famous uh, Polish director uh, his name was Grotowski. And then he said, he asked an actor, so um, have you ever had your heart broken? And he goes, <laughs> uh, once, you know, like that, my heart was broken. And he goes, well, every night your heart needs to break. <laughs> You're an athlete of the heart. Wow. Yeah. And then so, so look, for actors, they have to, uh, the audience will kind of react to technique. They may or may not. Right. But to see somebody actually vulnerable and open themselves up, they will always react to that. And it's the same thing with writers. Like I, I've had, I've had uh, writers who, who've written the end of a play and then it's, and it's a happy ending. Like the, somebody who's been persecuted by a landowner or something. Uh, and I say, oh, and then they're offering you a job now. Yeah, to, to work for that same guy who took away your family's land. And then the writer at that time said, well, yeah, he, he tells them no. And I said, is that really what happens? And he goes, no. He goes to work for him and it just twists him up inside right, for the rest right. of his life. And I said, that's what you want to put on stage. Don't be afraid to tell the truth. Well, thank you so much for telling us the truth oh. <laughs> about creativity and about your theater. Um, We'll have to talk a little bit further in the future. Thank oh, you so definitely. much. Definitely. Yeah, thank you thank for you. having me. Thank you. On Island Focus today, you've had the pleasure of meeting Harry Wong, who is the artistic director for Kumukuhua Theater. Happy you could join us. a very special opportunity today on Island Focus to meet Sharon Moriwaki, who is the Senator in the Hawaii State Legislature. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. This Good is a here. very different role than I know you at the university. Certainly different. <laughs> uh, at the university, you know, I was with the Public Policy Center. We worked together. It was great times. And you have a policy role, you have an advocacy role, an education role. On this side of the table, uh, you've got to listen to everybody <laughs> and try to gauge, you know, uh, what's right. It's very difficult because everybody has a good case. Well, in so my experience different. of working with you at the university is that you are a very good listener. Perhaps some of the challenge, you know, in this different role is that I'm not sure people always tell us the truth. So how do you decipher what is truth and what is in the best interest of other people and what is self-serving? I think that's a good question. Um, you never really know the truth. I mean, everybody has their own truth when they come to you. It is really, really passionate and they feel this is it. Uh, but I think part of it is looking at kind of where all the voices are coming from mm. and, and being able to judge, okay, what is in the best interest of most people? 
So it, everybody has a truth. I, I think even in the short-term rentals that have been a problem for my district recently, is everybody has a truth. Everybody feels really, this is really important. It's my livelihood. And, and so you've got to be able to sort of raise it to another level, I guess, in terms of what, what is best for our, our larger community. Yes, and, and along those lines, you know, some of the work that you've done in the past too is bringing communities together to have those conversations and think beyond oneself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are you doing that now? Because once your title changes, the persona <laughs> in people's minds change too. You know, that that's an interesting question because it, it still hasn't changed for me. Right. I mean, I think you, you probably grow into it, maybe. Uh, but for me, I, I think I still am a community person. Mm -hmm. So my job, I feel I work for the community that elected me. They pay my salary, basically. So I listen to them, but, but also educate because there are issues that are broader than our little community. It, it really does, for short term, it, it, it expands across the county, across the state. So part of it is listening and hearing what are the, the mutual interests? What are, where, where is their consensus? Um, because, and ha helping know. them see also how they yeah. are related. Yeah, and that's the challenge because when you have your own um, interest in mind and you're really hurting, um, you can't see beyond yourself. Right, so, right. Yeah. One of the things I appreciated when I was in the ledge as well um, is the opportunity to travel and see other places and see what, what happens in other places policy-wise. Have you been to a place lately that has impressed you or depressed you? <laughs> Interesting you should ask. We just got back from Singapore. Mm. Um, I'm on the housing committee uh, in the Senate and one of the major issues is housing, affordable housing for mm -hmm. our residents. And mm -hmm. we've been grappling with that. We have the, the cost of housing and, and the need for housing. So the demand far outweighs the, the supply uh, that we the, have, yeah, the right? supply, yeah. So uh, one of the, the areas, Singapore, uh, was touted as having a public housing. Public housing without stigma. So about 90% of the population lives a resident population uh, lives in uh, public housing and there um, you can see what difference long-range planning you know we talk about that all the time <laughs> long-range planning integrated planning comprehensive planning and implementation not you know oh, okay i want this piece right. or that piece or um and and it's it works, <laughs> you know, and it's a meritocracy. I mean, it's, it's also, I mean, some things aren't translatable like it is a um, dictatorship, <laughs> um, but, but it's a bene beneficent. <laughs> beneficent. And so you see that the focus is always on the people. How right. do we get more housing? How do we make it affordable? And, um, and you can see what everybody working together can really accomplish. So, Yes, and my impression of Singapore really is that it's, it's a place that works, and it is about people. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in closing our com short conversation for today, <laughs> what's a message you'd like the public to hear? You know, I, I go back to the short-term rentals and, and how it's, it's, it's permeated because they're illegals and people are making money, and, and, and it's really tough to enforce. But I have to applaud this, the city council. They, they do have two strong enforcement bills. But... It didn't come about until residents stood up. Hmm. They got more engaged. They really went out to, to talk to their neighbors and they didn't realize all of their neighbors had the same problem they hmm. did. People were encroaching into their neighborhoods that were supposed to be their quiet neighborhoods. Uh, and, and I think that's the message is all of us work for you. Call your council member, call your senator, call your legislators, um, and, and make sure that they know the problems and that they do something to help you. So I think that's really, really important for them to step up to be more aware and involved. And what you just said also is work together with each other. And work okay. together. Thank you so much for the time and good luck to you. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Enjoy your, thank you your so new much. profession. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful thank talking to you. Again. Thank you. Thank you too for tuning into Island Focus and my conversation with Senator Sharon Morawaki of the Hawaii Legislature. Aloha.
I'm at the Hawaii State Art Museum with Matt Matisse, who is the Executive Director for the Judiciary History Center. Happy to be with you. So nice to see you again. Nice to see you too, Lana. You have a very yeah. busy day at the Judiciary History Center. Can you share with us where you're located and what, what are some of the programs that are there? We are located in Ali'iolani Hale. We're fronted by the King Kamehameha statue. We are on the ground floor. We do outreach for the Hawaii State Judiciary, so we're an education program. Our mission is to interpret Hawaii's legal history and um, provide learning opportunities about the third branch of government, the judiciary. And through that, we really hit all branches of government. Well, and the work that we've done together over the years, you know, with teachers and schools and students with, with, with regards to the Constitution. Um, very important work about the past, but it also ties into the present and the future. I think that's what you like the most. We're very fortunate to have the opportunity to take hard looks at our past and figure out what we can learn and move forward. So what's the most rewarding part of your job in working with the teachers? They're dying for our content. So, um, it, you know, we're, they're coming to us for information. Um, so they're a, they're a wonderful audience, they're receptive. And then really, for me, the most rewarding thing is not only working with the teachers, but working with the students and um, seeing how the teachers are able to convey our content to the students and seeing where the students take that information. You have access to so many different people in our state that lend their expertise and their generosity, but also their understanding of mm -hmm. how important history is to the present. And what you do so well that I remember is engaging people in dialogue. And you're not only your workshops and your seminars, but also out in the public. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and when do the Judiciary History Center is involved, people get a little bit uncomfortable because there's judiciary, which is the courts, and they don't understand it. And then there's history, which they may not understand. But the fact that you've created a place where people can go and be safe is really important. Yeah, um, and I think that was the uh, that's one of the ideas of our school tours. It's a, it's a place for kids to experience a courtroom without an Indeed, actual court. case. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We try to create a comfortable space, and those are the spaces where we can have the hard conversations about important issues that have affected our past and continue to affect our, our future. So, when a school wants to set up a tour to the history center, mm -hmm. what's the first thing they do after the contact when when they arrive? Before they arrive, they can call us at 539-4999, or everything can be done online. So they can book tours online. Um, we take grades two through college. Our school tours, they'll complement the Department of Education's benchmarks. So grade three, we've patterned the tour after the DOE's benchmarks. They last about an hour, hour 15 minutes. So it's a tour through the center, but at the same time, you're giving them content. Content, yeah. So they usually start with a learning experience in our movie theater. We have a theater with um, different presentations based on their grade level. They will experience our exhibitions. We have uh, several exhibits. They'll always experience a culminating activity in our restored courtroom. So we have a courtroom that's been restored to its 1913 condition. Mm -hmm and we use that for mock trials and, and the, the courtroom activities. Well, thank you so much for sharing a little bit of what you do there and what's available, um, and I know that the viewing audience will appreciate contacting you. Oh, thank you, Ayla. Thank you for joining us in meeting Matt Matisse, who's the Executive Director for the Judiciary History Center. Aloha. here in the courtyard of the Art Museum. And it looks like there's a lot of work and construction that's happening here. What's, what's going on? Um, well, we're really excited about this. This is our sculpture garden. Uh, it opened in 2012, and um, we're actually renovating it. We're improving the lighting, and it's beautiful when it's lit up at night. We're taking care of the painting. We're actually putting in new hala trees as well. So it's going to be fantastic. And renovating some of the existing and new pieces. Yeah, definitely. A lot of these works of art were um, installed at the time of opening in 2012. And um, we're really excited about just 
making sure that this place looks amazing. Um, and yeah. I know that you're very, very excited about Mr. Chicken Pants. <laughs> yeah. Our what, what is the significance here? Uh, Mr. Chicken Pants is actually the most recent commission work of art that we have had installed in this sculpture garden by artist Mei Izumi, who's a graduate of Kalani, local artist. And she uh, created this work of art for the sculpture garden a few years ago, and it's finally here, and we can't wait to celebrate it. So commissioned means you put out a call yes. for artists to propose their work. Yes. It's and part of chosen. Yeah, exactly. It's part of the um, Art in Public Places program, the commission works of art for site-specific, large-scale works of art. You know what's so wonderful about this is that you said we could touch it, right? Yeah, you can. <laughs> yes, it's interactive. And the fact that it is, it is playful. Yes. Art doesn't always have to be something that's confusing. Exactly. It can be um, friendly, it can be playful, it can be whatever you want to make of it. And that's something that we really want to get across to people when they come visit the Hawaii State Art Museum. Mahalo for joining me in meeting Hannah Kraft, who is with the Honolulu Museum of Art. Thank you for being with us. And thank you for taking the time to come into this place, which is different than your place. <laughs> it is. Thank you so much for the invitation. You know, I remember growing up uh, with the Honolulu Museum of Art being called the Art Academy. Yes, that's correct. So some time ago, they rebranded and renamed it the Honolulu Museum of Art. It merged with the Contemporary Museum, and we're now one big um, multi-site facility supporting students and artists and teachers and schools to do what we can to um, help education and arts education here. Yeah, and to promote the creativity in, in everyone, you know, and to inspire. Lini Kona is also connected with you folks. That's correct, and that's one of the programs that I manage there. All of the youth classes there at the Lini Kona building, which we now call the Honolulu Museum of Art School. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe you can explain a little bit more about those youth programs, because I know at one time when my son was very young, it was the most um, amazing summer for him to experience his own creativity. That's so nice to hear. So those summer programs are in session right now. We're about halfway through and gearing up and preparing for next school year's programs. We offer those tuition-based classes for Keiki ages three to 18, three times a year. So we have fall sessions, spring sessions, and summer sessions. And we also offer financial aid scholarships for those programs. So they're accessible to all of Hawaii's young artists. You know, and when we think about art, we look around at your museum and this one as well, um, it seems that the, the focus is on graphic arts, on painting with different medium, but that's not how you define art. That's true. So <laughs> there's a lot of thinking about this now, talking about um, 3D kids stuck in a 2D world. Hmm. And there's this antiquated idea that art is drawing or painting or figurative sculpture, but we're really more interested in cultivating a creative way of life and helping students learn what it's like to be an artist. How does an artist move through the world? How do they see the world? How do they interact with other artists and people? So um, yeah, that's our work and I really feel it's important to cultivate play and to help students understand that it's okay to take risks and make mistakes and learn from them and collaborate. Those, those important 21st century skills that are a little softer and harder to teach through the content areas that they're um, learning in school. Well, and ironically, what you're talking about actually is being human. Right, yeah. <laughs> Artists are people, and they're good people most of the time. You know, I, I really wish there we could, could be a public conversation on how um, everyone is an artist in their own way and how they live their life. That's part of the philosophy that your youth programs promote. Exactly. So we're now rooting most of our youth programs in a pedagogy called Teaching for Artistic Behaviors rooted in the idea that we need input to create output. So if you think of any sort of creative faculty, um, we want to inspire so that they can make inspired work. And that work can be anything. It could be the clothes that you put on this morning, or the way you plated your dinner last night, or the way you arrange your desk. Those are aesthetic choices. And we just want people to acknowledge that they are creative. This idea that you're either artistic or not. Right, <laughs> we were told. Yeah, it's not helpful to anyone. We're all creative, we all have that capacity. And at the museum, we're really trying to empower lifelong learners. So we have those youth classes that I manage, as well as adult classes. For instance, you know, how would you frame creativity for a surfer? 
Ooh, well, <laughs> I mean, everyone's got their own style, right? Um, whether you stand goofy foot, if you like to ride longboard or shortboard, the waves that you choose, the beaches that you go to, that's your style, right? What your board looks like. What you wear? Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Now, in what artist field are you a specialist? So I went to school for sculpture, and I currently make prints. But really, whatever it takes, I just need to get the idea out of my head sometimes. And that's what we want to share with students. So you segued from sculpture to these various other forms. How does that happen? You know, our lives are so interdisciplinary all mm -hmm. the time. When one chooses a career, they might choose a different path a few years later. Yeah. And we want to share with students that that's OK, too, that um, they might feel like drawing one day and painting another day or playing with clay the next. It's all creative, and it's all about um, how you approach it. And if you're going into it with an open mind and understanding that there's no right or wrong, that's really what I want to share with Kiki. And discovering more about who we are through different medium. Correct, we can learn so much about ourselves and the work that we make and the work that we're attracted to or um, averted, <laughs> avert from. Um, and yeah. the gifts we can offer of course, to the world. Yeah, I mean, there's something really, really powerful in this sort of swipe culture that we live in now, mm. giving students the opportunity to physically make something, to, um, to take an idea from their mind and put it out into the world. That's really empowering and can be especially beneficial for um, students who are more challenging or not quite as gifted in other areas. Or bored in school. Yes, <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, art can be something to look forward to. We think it actually increases attendance, but that's something that's really tricky to measure. Sure, sure. Well, thank you for your energy and your creativity. Uh, appreciate that you had a little bit of time for us today. Of course, thanks so much for thank letting you. me share. Wonderful conversation with Hannah Kraft, who is with the Honolulu Museum of Art. Glad you could be with us. Mahalo to the Hawaii State Art Museum for hosting us today and to you for tuning in to Island Focus. I'm Lila Bird. Aloha and malama pono. Take care of each other. See you soon. <laughs>